Okay, we are recording. So good morning to you all once again, and welcome uh, to our actually our last Thursday class of the semester. Uh, as as it happens, we we began in August, believe it or not, and here we are in December. Uh, and um, uh, so the uh, relevant housekeeping notes are as follows. Um, oh, well, thank you so much, Mom. It's very kind of you. I actually have have uh, enjoyed teaching you also this term and. I mean, the truth is that, uh, of course, I, I really enjoy teaching anyway, but always prefer to do so in the classroom where I get to meet people and see people in the flesh. I think it's a more productive way, but we're fortunate, uh, of course, that we have this platform. Otherwise, we'd, we'd totally be unable to uh, conduct classes. So, I mean, it's at least the good news is we can do it virtually although I've argued for a very long time that many things are better in reality, <laughs> notwithstanding the power of the digital revolution, there's still something to be said for reality. Um, but in any case, here we are, um, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed interacting enormously with, with you, uh, and uh, I'll look forward to resuming teaching next term. That was Erica's question, yes. Uh, I am uh, teaching, um, Erica, you won't need uh, the 10200 class again, um, but I am teaching that one. Uh, I'm also teaching Chinese philosophy, um, and that may uh, may interest you. It's part of the Asian philosophy cycle that I've instituted here more than 20 years ago. So we go through a cycle of Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and Buddhism, three different courses, and they are, I think, cross-listed with Asian studies. Uh, but in any case, I'll be teaching Chinese philosophy next term as a, uh, an elective. Uh, and those of you who will have completed this course, I think will be eligible to take any other philosophy elective. Our department, our department has some great offerings for you. So uh, please uh, take advantage of those if you're able to. Uh, so just to repeat the, the um, scheduling arrangements, uh, today is our last breakout group. Uh, but Monday will be the final plenary. I am not going to introduce new material on Monday. Today we'll finish covering Newcomb's problem and look at a couple of perhaps surprising real-world applications that it has. Um, and that will complete the formal treatment of the material for us in this third section of the course. Monday, however, I will be doing a plenary at the usual time, 9.30 on Monday morning. That's the last class period of the semester and I will be happy at that time to take any questions that you may wish to raise either about any of the material that we've covered this uh, in this section namely Zeno's paradoxes uh, Anselm's ontological argument the prisoner's dilemma in both two person and uh, n person formulations including the tragedy of the commons and free writing uh, those very important topics that affect all of us, and indeed Newcomb's problem. I'm not going to present new material Monday, but again, I'll be happy to take questions that you may wish to bring to the session on any of those readings and discussions. Um, and indeed, I'll be happy to expand the conversation if any of you have larger questions uh, pertaining to philosophy either this course or beyond this course, anything that's philosophical is, is fair game as far as I'm concerned, but we'll start foc with a focus on obviously the material that we've just covered. Um, and then if, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to raise them. So that will be Monday's lecture and that will officially end the uh, lecture portion of the course. And then as I said, <clears throat> and we'll repeat your final essays, essay number three, will be due the following Monday, um, which is the uh, the 14th of December, I make it. Uh, indeed, the 14th of December. Uh, and I'll open the portal on Blackboard, um, you know, in, in a few days. I don't imagine anybody's uh, got their uh, third essay ready yet, but I'll open the, the, um, the portal and you'll be free to Upload. So I know some of you are early birds, and that's a great thing. It makes my job a bit easier if you want to upload your essays earlier. That's fine. All uh, it just means that your final grade will be submitted earlier, um, or at least on time. I do them all at once. But please don't be late. 
because I have a deadline to meet as well. There, there is an end of term deadline by which I will need to get the grades in. And those of you who are missing uh, a component uh, will end up with an incomplete, which is not the end of the world, but it will then turn into something worse if you don't remedy it. And I know that with COVID, they're giving people, or at least this term, last term, we gave people uh, a reasonable window into the next semester in which to complete work that was incomplete. I'm not sure yet what the new deadline will be, uh, but it's always, uh, I think, to your advantage uh, to get your work in on time. Uh, that That's the main thing. Then you know that if your work is in on time, then you'll be graded on time uh, and you can simply move on. All right, are there any questions about any of the housekeeping uh, before we uh, resume Newcomb's problem? Any questions at all? Is everybody okay with this? Apparently so. Very well. In that case, let's return to uh, oh, when will you expect, or, okay, I, I misspoke, Mame, and I apologize. You cannot expect a final grade early uh, because the system, um, the system allows me to enter grades once uh, unless they're change of grade forms that, that come in late, you know, for late grades. But when I enter grades for this section, I will be entering them all at one time, that's the way I have to do it. There's a web page and I have to enter everybody's grades, at least everybody for whom I have a grade, and then I submit them to the registrar, there's a whole process, and I submit them one time for everyone who's completed the course or will have completed the requirements, and that's it. So if you get your work in early, what I meant to say is then you can be assured that you'll be graded on time. I have a deadline and I'm not sure when it is yet, but I always meet it, of course. So um, if you get your paper in early, um, then you can be assured that it'll be graded early and that your final grade will be submitted by the due date. If you get your paper in late, uh, then you, you will lose that assurance. I mean, if it's a day or two late, I won't mind. I'm not encouraging you to be late, believe me. We are cutting students more slack this term. We're being much more lenient with late submissions. I don't penalize them as strictly as I normally would because I understand many of you are struggling with all the complications that have been foisted upon us in the last year or so. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I, I would urge you to get your grades in as close to the due date as possible. That way you'll be guaranteed that I'll grade them. I mean, get your essays in. You'll be guaranteed that I'll grade them and that I'll submit your final grades. If you're a week late, I can't guarantee it. Uh, you know, if you're two weeks late, um, almost certainly you'll get an incomplete, which you can remedy next term, as I say. Just means uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, there'll be a delay. Um, and your transcript will also have that delay. It takes them a while to enter and completes once they're completed. Do you understand? So you're always better off being on time. That's a life lesson. Anything else? <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, no other questions at the moment, fine. So let's uh, resume then. And the, the, the first thing I want to ask you, I'm gonna share the screen with you uh, and, and, and make sure uh, that you're all clear about Newcomb's problem. Before we continue, just bear with me. I'll see if I can share the screen. It seems to be cooperating today. So you can all see this, right? And uh, you uh, know that Newcomb's problem by its very uh, payoff structure is a prisoner's dilemma. We, we've been through that. And uh, you know that unlike a prisoner's dilemma, you're, you're not playing against a fellow prisoner. Rather, you're playing against a a being called Newcomb's demon, who is an incredibly good predictor of what people do, just to recapitulate. So you will have had a chance before your turn comes to watch all these other players. Let's say the whole class lines up to play. So you each play one turn at a time. And uh, you know that 
uh, the way the game unfolds is in a strict sequence that uh, there are two boxes in front of you. I'll just scroll backwards in case some of you are already behind um, in this problem. Uh, you know that that uh, there are two boxes in front of you. Box A is transparent, contains $1,000, which is yours if you want it. Box B is opaque. It's gift wrapped. You can't see inside it. Contains either a million or nothing. And that depends on what the demon's going to predict about you. So unlike a prisoner's dilemma, there's a strict sequence to this game. And the sequence is as follows. When you step up and it's your turn to play, first the demon reads your mind. Because you're going to have two choices. You're going to be able to choose either both boxes, in which case you'll get the contents of both boxes, or you're going to be able to choose box B alone. Those are your two choices. But before you do that, before you make your choice, the demon's going to make its prediction. And if the demon predicts that you're going to choose box B alone, then, in fact, it places a million dollars in box B. That's where the million's going to come from. But if the demon predicts that you're going to choose both boxes, then it puts nothing in box B. But you can't see what it's doing. So there's either a million there or nothing there, but you don't know which uh, until you make your choice, obviously. Uh, because whether you choose box B only or whether you choose both boxes, you're going to find out <laughs> what box B contains, but only after you will have chosen. Okay, so we clear. And remember, the demon has an unlimited amount of money. The demon doesn't care about money at all. Um, and the demon's happy to award money to people. Uh, it keeps re resetting the every time someone comes up to play, it keeps resetting, you know, um, the conditions of the game. But what the demon's really interested in is making correct predictions. And as you observe people playing in front of you, you're able to watch and you're able to see their choice. And what you notice every time they choose either box B alone, almost every time they choose box B alone, they get a million dollars. You can watch this any number of times. And every time, almost every time they choose both boxes, they turn out getting the thousand that's there anyway, but box B will have nothing in it. So what you realize is that this demon has an uncanny ability basically to read people's minds or to predict correctly with, with, a, with a frequency that's near perfect. It predicts correctly what each player's choice is in turn. So then it comes your turn, and, uh, and you're confronted by a dilemma which resembles the prisoner's dilemma in terms of the possible choices you might want to make. Because what we saw, if you look at the payoff structure, uh, again, we're looking at, at the T being the temptation to take both boxes in this case, right? R being the reward for believing that the demon's going to correctly predict your choice if you pick box B only, and therefore you get a million dollars. P being the kind of punishment you get if you choose both boxes and the demon predicted it, then the demon puts nothing in box B, so you only get the $1,000 that you, you know, were eligible to collect all along. And S is the sucker's payoff, which it almost never happens where you believe the demon's going to predict correctly that you will have chosen box B only, but the demon in this case makes an incorrect prediction and predicts you're going to pick both boxes, so it puts nothing in box B. But that almost never happens. Indeed, it turns out that <clears throat> uh, this, this is the most common outcome, and this is the most common outcome, that players who end up choosing box B only almost always get a million because the demon will have predicted it correctly, whereas players who choose both boxes almost always end up getting a 1,000 because the demon will have predicted it correctly. Uh, but the payoff structure itself is exactly that of a prisoner's dilemma, which I hope you see. So technically, Newcomb's problem is a special kind of prisoner's dilemma. And what makes it special is not so much the ordering of the game, which is obviously different from a prisoner's dilemma, but the, the constraints placed on the payoff. So in this particular case, the sucker's payoff is zero dollars and the other constraint is that the t payoff is the sum of r plus p 
other than that, uh, the strict uh, ordering of them is preserved so that structurally it is a prisoner's dilemma. And precisely because of that, the same conflict will come up between two principles of choice. Um, dominance will tell you, obviously, that if you choose both boxes, whatever the demon predicts, you can see quite clearly that a million plus a thousand is greater than a million, right? And also, clearly, a thousand is greater than nothing. So whatever the demon predicts, dominance principle will tell you you're better off choosing both boxes. Because in either case, you're going to do better choosing both box, both boxes than one box alone, right? No matter what the demon predicts, you're better off in both cases choosing both boxes. So therefore, dominance says choose both boxes. So that's one principle. The other argument once again, is maximizing expected utilities. And you're able to watch this game being played by everybody before your turn comes, and you're able to see, and if you want to write down the frequency of correct predictions, you'll notice the demon's almost always correct in its predictions. So you are all, all able to see that. We'll assume the demon's predictions are like 0.9999% correct, or that that means, I mean, 0.999, correct, almost 100%, meaning that um, the probability, right, that there's a million dollars in box B if you choose box B is very close to one. So if you compute the expected utility of box B only, it's very nearly one times a million plus very nearly zero times zero, because if the probability of this is almost one, then the probability of that is almost zero. So basically, you know that the expected utility, your expected utility of choosing box B only is almost a million. Whereas uh, the expected utility of both boxes, similarly, you, you see that the demon almost always correctly predicts when the player chooses two boxes. So almost with uh, the same probability one, if the player chooses both boxes, there's a thousand in it. So the probability of that is similarly near zero. So therefore the expected utility of choosing both boxes is near zero times a million plus a thousand, which is in, in turn near zero plus near unity times a thousand, which is approximately a thousand. So obviously your expected utility of box B only is nearly a million dollars. Your expected utility of choosing both boxes is only around a thousand dollars. So therefore, the expected utility of choosing box B alone is much, much greater than the expected utility of choosing both boxes. So that principle of maximizing expected utilities would lead you to believe, would lead you to choose box B alone. So you see that you have exactly, we encounter the same divergence of choice as we did in the prisoner's dilemma. Is that much clear to you? I'll pause now for questions, but uh, remember, just as in the prisoner's dilemma, strictly speaking, you don't even need the demon to be that good for maximizing expected utilities to prescribe that you choose box B only. What you need to observe is that the demon's relative frequency of correct predictions needs to be only more than a half. If even if the demons write, you know, 80% of the time, 70% of the time, 60% of the time, anything more than 50% of the time, in fact, it will turn out that if you just do the math, that uh, if the demons correct uh, uh, predictive frequency is more than 50%, then actually you're still better off choosing box B only because the utility of doing that will be greater. The expected utility will be greater for box B only. Okay, so those are the two. Uh, principles which would lead you in divergent directions, obviously. Um, I'll just come back to the room now and see if uh, if you have any questions before we continue. Um, is this clear to everyone? I've just reviewed what we covered last day. So is that all right? It is. Good. Well, I'm glad it is. I mean, if it's not, then ask. But if this is clear, it means you've been paying attention, either you were there on Monday or you watched the video 
Um, and, and so you're on top of this. And moreover, as I said last day, and I'll reiterate, if you have understood previously from last week what we covered in the prisoner's dilemma, then you'll see that Newcomb's problem is not different with respect to these divergent principles of choice. So understanding the prisoner's dilemma is going to make it much easier to understand Newcomb's problem clearly. Um, and since I'm getting a few yeses, then that's fine. Uh, I just want now to, to make a new point that came up toward the end of Monday. Some of you were there, or some of you hopefully by now have seen the video. So you know um, that I mentioned that the philosopher who uh, first published the paper about Newcomb's problem that brought it to the attention of the philosophical community and everybody else, because it's pretty widespread now. That was 1969. That's already a long time ago. But Robert Nozick at Harvard published the first paper on Newcomb's problem. And it was told to him, apparently, by a physicist. And uh, it was his to publish. He, he loved the problem. And he always uh, taught it at Harvard. And, and he said in his paper that the students, almost every year, whenever he brought this problem up in class, he said that the students divided more or less 50-50. Yes, that's right, Abraham. Not exactly 50-50, but there was always a pretty close divergence, more or less 50-50 in the class between one boxers and two boxers, as they're called. Just as in the prisoner's dilemma, there'd be a, a, a divergence, uh, whether cooperation or defection is your choice. There's a reason for doing both, yeah? That's why it's a dilemma. And... Um, and he found this year after year, uh, if you pick box B only, you're called a one boxer. <laughs> if you choose two boxes, you're called a two boxer. Okay. So I asked the class uh, every year that I've taught this problem at City College. I also teach this regularly. And I found the same thing as Nozick found that most of the time it divides up pretty evenly. 50% of the class generally more or less chooses uh, box B only, and 50% more or less chooses both boxes. And as Nozick said, each each half thinks the other half is being silly or is making the wrong choice. So I mean that that there is no right or wrong choice, but you know there are reasons for uh, making either choice, you know? um, and that's what makes the problem interesting, right? So this time um, something different happened on Monday. Uh, I was I was actually very happy uh, and intrigued. You know, we learn by teaching. Uh, we learn by learning, and we also learn by teaching. And I learned something really interesting on Monday, thanks to you, or thanks to the larger group that was in attendance, because when we actually wanted to play, um, well, that was one point. Oh, I'm glad you were attentive to that. Someone wanted to flip a coin. That was another thing that came up. And there was actually a simpler answer to that, Timothy, but great that you were attentive. Um, and I don't remember exactly who posed that question, but it was a really one of the students posed that question. Uh, and I think it was a she and she said, what if I flip a coin? And uh, that's a really interesting question. And the, my answer was and my answer still would be that if you step up uh, and it's your turn to play the game, um, if the demon reads your mind correctly, then the demon will know that you intend to flip a coin or that you've already flipped a coin. And so you're not really choosing either box B only or both boxes. You're leaving it up to chance. And in that case, my argument is, my response is that the demon will put nothing in, in box B. If the demon knows or predicts that you're going to flip a coin, the demon will not reward that behavior. The demon will put nothing in box B. And I'll tell you why, and there's a particular reason, which is a fairly rigorous one, and it's really a corollary of what I already mentioned to you, that if you, from the player's perspective, believe that the demon is going to predict correctly with frequency greater than one half, then you ought to choose box B only, because maximizing expected utilities will tell you that your uh, expected utility of box B only is greater than both boxes, if, on the condition, that the demon's correct frequency of prediction is more than a half. And that comes from a corollary from the prisoner's dilemma. Do you remember back to that, where if you know that, and I said this explicitly in class, 
if you know that your fellow prisoner in a prisoner's dilemma is slipping a coin, then you pretty much have to defect in order to protect yourself. Remember that maximizing expected utilities in the prisoner's dilemma prescribes that you cooperate just in case you believe that the probability of joint cooperation is greater than a half. So if you think that both prisoners are going to cooperate with probability greater than a half, that is to say you cooperate conditional on your belief, on your belief that, that your fellow prisoner cooperates as well, then you should definitely do it if, your, if the probability of that in your estimation is greater than a half. But if you know that your fellow prisoner is going to flip a coin, then the probability that they cooperate um, jointly with you is not any longer greater than a half. It's only a half, and therefore you should defect. So in, in the case that your fellow prisoner is flipping a coin, so if you're in there with a gambler and you know that this person's not rational, but they're, they like to gamble, so they're just going to flip a coin, then you pretty much have to defect to protect yourself. And so in that case, uh, maximizing expected utility as a decision principle would actually converge with dominance, okay? Only in that case where the probability of joint cooperation is less than a half. And that comes from your knowing somehow or believing that the other player is going to flip a coin. So I'm just now extrapolating that, Timothy, and there's nothing in the literature or in the setup of the Newcomb's problem that tells us explicitly what the demon would do because the rules are that you choose either box b or both right the rules don't have some exception that says you could flip a coin but i'm just guessing or rather more than guessing that the, the demon being rational would argue exactly the same way as i've just argued in terms of the prisoner's dilemma and that if the demon knew you were going to flip a coin um, then it would not reward that behavior it would put nothing in box b so you're still going to be obliged to make a rational choice rather than a random choice. Okay, Timothy, I mean, there's no unequivocal answer to that because I haven't encountered that question directly in the literature either. So that is a new question. Um, so is that, is that all right? I mean, do you get my answer? Do you understand? Yeah, it is an interesting point. It really is. Uh, but that's not the lesson. The main lesson I took away from Monday was actually something else, which I'll share with you now. But you're right to remind me that that was another interesting question. The other thing that came up um, was, was the actual result. And those of you who were there or saw the video, you know that in this one case, and it's the first time it's ever happened, that we had uh, something like 14 out of 15 or 19 out of 20 people, whoever put in their responses when I asked what they do. And we had a whole bunch of people saying, you know, box B only or both boxes. And in this unique case, is the first time in my experience, there were an overwhelming majority of people who said that they were going to uh, choose box B only. And only one person said uh, that they would choose uh, both boxes. And I asked her why. And she gave a very good answer. The, for the one person who said, I'll take two boxes. And you, and the answer is that, 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 that I know there's a thousand there. And at least I'm going to get a thousand. I'll take that. You know, I mean, I'll be happy to take the thousand dollars, and um, and maybe the demon predicts wrong, and I'll get the million too. But I'm guaranteed a thousand. Whereas if I pick box B only, I may well get the million, but in the worst case, I'm going to get nothing. So by actually, dominance tells you that you do better by choosing both, because you maximize the worst case. All right, you're taking the maximum of the minim, minimum outcomes. It's called minimax or maximin. In this case, maximin strategy. Um, I'll type that in. Maximin, it means what you're doing when you choose both boxes. Maximin is you're, you're maximizing the minimum outcome, right? Because in this game, the minimum outcome is either going to be zero right? Just in case you choose both boxes and, uh, I'm sorry, if you choose box B only and the demon incorrectly predicts, so you get zero is one minimum outcome. The other minimum outcome um, is if you just take both boxes and the demon correctly predicts it, so there's nothing in box B, that means you get a thousand. So the two minimum outcomes are a thousand uh, versus zero. And that's an argument for taking both boxes because the maximum of the minimums is a thousand 
which is definitely better than zero. That's another way of running the dominance argument. So anyway, she said that she would take the thousand rather than gamble on the, uh, you know, maybe getting a million or maybe getting nothing. And that's a perfectly legitimate argument. I'm sure you could see the merits of that argument, whether you would have taken one box own, box B only or both, you could see the merits of that argument, right? But, but it was the first time I'd ever seen such an imbalance as most of the other, all of the other people who declared what they would do, between 15 and 20 of them said they would take box B only. So I was trying to account for that and uh, to understand why there was such, for the first time, a real disparity in the declared outcomes. I don't know what everyone else was thinking of doing because they didn't say, and maybe it would have come out of the wash with so many people in the room. Uh, maybe it would have come out, had everyone declared their uh, choice, maybe it would have come closer to 50-50, but we'll never know. So it made me think. And what it made me think of was that although the two decision principles in this game, just like in the prisoner's dilemma, are always going to diverge, regardless of the payoffs themselves, as long as that same transit of ordering of payoffs is preserved, as long as, in other words, that you're in a real dilemma, prisoner's dilemma by, by virtue of the payoff structure itself, or indeed you're in a Newcomb problem by virtue of that same payoff structure, the two principles, every time you look at dominance, uh, it's going to tell you the same thing. And every time you look at maximizing expected utilities, it's going to tell you the same thing, regardless of the absolute values of the payoffs, as long as they're in that same ordering. But in this particular problem, it does make a difference what the absolute values are of those payoffs. And so I just want to show you what I mean. I'm going to give you three different examples of Newcomb's problem played with the normal payoffs and then played with inflated payoffs, played with deflated payoffs. And when we look at those, we'll understand, I think uh, we'll have an, a, a way of explaining why in this case there was such a divergence. So I'm going to try and share uh, the screen again and hopefully it will still be cooperating. Uh, so it is. My luck is holding. Okay. So you can see the new uh, screen, right? And um, this is the standard problem. We, we've already seen this. This is the problem we were all deciding on the basis of on, on Monday. So again, the argument is that if you pick both boxes, you're guaranteed $1,000. That money is sitting there. And, and that's, you know, money that's, you can just, all you have to do is choose both boxes and you can just collect it. And if the demon predicts wrongly, then you're going to get the million and the thousand. So you have nothing to lose and you're going to gain at least a thousand. So that's an argument for dominance, right? Whereas if you really believe the demon is, is as good a mind reader as it appears to be, then you're willing to take a chance because you'd much rather have a million. I mean, we could all use a thousand, absolutely. But of course, if you want to take a chance, that million is, is a lot more. It's a thousand times more. So you might want to take that chance, which most of you did. But then the chance you're taking is that you might end up with nothing. But you think it's worth the risk, obviously. Okay. So that's the dilemma, right? And then I was thinking, but in a real world scenario, I mean, this is not a problem we can experiment with because no one has that much money to give away, except maybe Jeff Bezos. I don't think he's going to be funding any Newcomb problem experiments, although maybe I should write to him and ask him. I don't think that he will, nor do I think it's ethical. I don't think we'd be allowed to conduct such an experiment <laughs> in a university with real money. I don't think it would be legitimate to do so. Um, but in any case, what I'm saying to you is that in a real world scenario, if we think about adjusting not the uh, ordering of the payoffs, but the absolute values of the payoffs, uh, we can keep the same ratios but, or similar ratios. But if we change the absolute value, it might turn out that people's decisions will change, not because the principles don't diverge any longer. They will always diverge, but because people's real world situations will be, uh, or their preferences in a real world situation, will be drastically altered depending how much money is really on the table here. 
So let me give you a quick example. The way the example is concocted in the literature is always with a thousand dollars versus a million. So it's clear that there's a temptation to take the thousand. Obviously, if you're thinking about who is this geared for, well, philosophy professors and philosophy students, right? Philosophers and students of philosophy, those were the people who read about it first. And so we're all more or less in the middle class with maybe some exceptions, but for most of us, fair to say, this uh, 10,000, this thousand dollars is certainly a temptation, clearly a temptation. Um, so we, we, we'd want to take it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's also clear that the million is very tempting uh, because of the probability of getting it if the demon's a correct predictor. So that's the tension in the model. But now let's go from the standard uh, model. Um, we'll go from the standard model. Uh, you see this, the standard payoffs? Are you still seeing the screen, by the way? Please tell me. You see, or I can't, is it yes? Yeah, okay, thank you. So I'm going to now say let's change the payoffs, not the ordering or the structure, but let's now change the payoff from standard payoffs to deflated payoffs. And I think you'll get my point right away. Let's say we're looking, you can all see this, please confirm. Yes or no, you can see this? Yes. Okay, thank you. So now we're looking at deflated payoffs. And all I've done is to deflate the currency. Here you have a thousand in box A, and here you have ten dollars. Okay, so I've taken it, I've deflated it by by a factor of a hundred. There's a hundred times less. All right now in box A, there's only 10 bucks in box A. Instead of 1,000, there's 10. And in box B, you know there's either going to be 10,000 or nothing. Okay, I've deflated that by a factor of 10 also. So now let me ask you this. If you were about to play this game, right? how many of you, with the same prediction rate, everything is the same except the absolute values have changed. The ratio is the same and the uh, structure is the same. But now, how many of you would take box B only? How many of you would go for the sure $10? Or how many of you would be willing to risk, you know, losing that $10 and gaining 10000 You understand the question? What would, I'm just asking you, what would you do in this game? If these were the payoffs, what would you do? You're sticking with box B only. Yes, and, and I'm saying in this game, it's it's most people, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are going to take box B only in this game. Why? Because you're not tempted by 10 bucks. I mean, 10 bucks is going to buy you lunch for sure, but 10,000 is really good compared to 10, right? So most of you are not going to be tempted by the $10. That's my assumption based on this okay okay veronica would still go for the 10 all right well that's a free you're guaranteed a free lunch all right now let me ask you a different question based on this game with these payoffs suppose you were playing this game in a homeless shelter suppose you're playing this game and you round up a bunch of people who you find who are basically panhandling people who are actually asking others for money because they really need money they're asking for spare change right or they're asking for a dollar or what have you if we played this game with a bunch of people who were really destitute and really needed money what do you think they would choose do you think that there would be an even distribution i'm just asking I haven't done the experiment and it would be unethical, but I'm just asking people, if people really were desperate, if the people playing this game with this payoff structure were really desperate for money, what do you think they would choose? Mostly, what would the majority choose? Any ideas? No ideas? I think both, Lexi. I agree with you. I think that if people really needed money, I mean, if you were down to your last dollar, you literally had nothing else, and you had an opportunity to get $10 then and there by picking both boxes, I think most people would take the 10. Maybe. But I, I, that's just a guess, okay? I think most people would pick the 10. Whereas in this group, 
I think most people would pick box B only because the ten dollars, while certainly it's going to get you lunch guaranteed, uh, the ten thousand is much more useful, and if you think you have a better probability of getting it um, because of the demon's prediction rate, then you probably pick box B only. Now let me ask a different question to you. All right, I'm going to play the same game with you, but now instead of um, deflating the payoffs, I'm going to inflate the payoffs. <laughs> now I've just inflated the payoffs by the same factor. So instead of instead of one thousand dollars in box A, now there's a hundred thousand dollars in box A. I've just inflated them by a factor of ten. Yeah, instead of uh, or rather a factor of a hundred. Excuse me. Instead of one thousand, there's a hundred thousand sitting there in box A. And instead of one million in box B, in case the demon predicts you'll choose box B only, now there's a hundred million in box B. Okay, so imagine now we're playing this game. Same game, same divergence of decision principles. Nothing has changed except for the raw amounts. Now how much? Ah, now Elijah is on to it. Of course, Elijah. Suddenly, both boxes is much more enticing because suddenly now we're guaranteed 100K. That's the worst we can do. Hey, I'll take that, right? We don't need 100 million. Of course, we'd maybe love to have it, but if we know that we're guaranteed. Oh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everyone. Of course, it makes sense that you would all, and I would probably do it too, although I'm normally a two boxer, I would say 100K, yeah, I'm going to go for that because, and I think only a big gambler is going to be willing at this point. You'd have to be a serious gambler, right? Or what? If we now had a bunch of billionaires, let's say now we're playing the game, not with people who are panhandling, but with people at the other end. We're talking about the wealthiest elites. Let's say we're now playing this game with Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Oprah and Obama and these people who are being showered with, you know, where they have billions of dollars, basically. Um, oh, the Obamas don't have that much yet, but they will soon. But we're talking about the, you know, the biggest, wealthiest players now that you can think of in the world, people who are billionaires. Okay, what do you think they're going to do? If they see this game, are they going to go for the both boxes? Or are they going to go for box B only? Imagine a bunch of billionaires playing. What do you think? Absolutely, Timothy. Absolutely. Because if you're a billionaire, then 100K doesn't excite you, right? 100K is like pocket money. They go on shopping trips and spend 100K. It's nothing for them. Um, whereas 100 million is significant. Yeah, they could do something with that. So... Um, I, yeah, I wish too. But here's the point, right? Remember that most of us were willing to forego the $10, right? If it was only 10 bucks, then we'd go for box B only in the hope of getting 10,000. If it's normally the standard payoffs, then there's a lot more division because we could all use a thousand, but we'd like to go for the million, right? So you're going to get a division here. Here, depending on who you play with, you're going to get either most people ignoring this and going for box B only, or people really need money, they're going to go for, bo for the both boxes. And if you inflate by a similar factor, you're going to discover just the same phenomenon operating in a different scale, that if you're playing with billion, if you're playing with normal people like us, middle class people, more or less, we're all going to say, hey, I can get 100K for taking both boxes, I'll take that. And maybe a few high rollers would still go for the hundred million. But if you're playing with billionaires, they don't care about this because that's pocket money for them. That's money. So they're going to go for this. So what I'm saying is that in all three cases, and this is why to summarize, I was interested in the disparate result that came out of Monday's plenary. Because in all three cases, the game is identical vis-a-vis -vis the payoff structure. This has not changed. It's the same. It's invariant. And moreover, the ratios in these two inflated cases are, are, are you know, they're factors of 100. So essentially, um, that nothing has changed in the, in, the, in the matrix. And also, nothing has changed in the decision principles. In all three cases, dominance tells you to take both boxes. And in all three cases, maximizing expected utility tells you to take box B only. But what really makes all the difference then is the absolute amounts and who the players are. So then it becomes really a socioeconomic problem and not so much a problem of rational choice. Okay? 
and that's not terribly surprising, is it? All right. So anyway, that was what I thought the really interesting result was. To me, it was the interesting result because changing the absolute values will really change people's decisions, although the decision principles themselves do not change in terms of their divergent prescriptions. Is this clear? Is everybody clear on that? Okay. So I thought that was interesting. Maybe you do or maybe you don't, but for me it was interesting. All right. So I'll stop sharing this screen. Now I want to come to the final point of today's lecture, and I did promise you real-world applications and this may I, I'm, I hope that some of you are going to be surprised by what follows because uh, you wouldn't think looking at this game it's a kind of ridiculous thought experiment um, uh, well how you play which game Abraham you want to get funding to run these experiments you're gonna good luck as I say I don't think that ethically we'd be allowed but in any case um, I want to now return to this really strange thing I think which are two plausible real-world applications which problems that turn out to be Newcomb's problems because remember the overarching thing in Newcomb's problem and what differentiates it from a prisoner's dilemma is that in a prisoner's dilemma both players are making their decision more or less simultaneously right within an hour or within a few minutes you know the cops come to one prisoner and they say typically they may be lying or not but they're going to say the other prisoner is already giving evidence against you what are you going to do and they go to the other prisoner and tell them the same story right oh your friend has already given evidence evidence against you what are you going to do so the decisions are being made fairly simultaneously but what we know in the Newcomb problem is that there's a strict sequence and we know that first the demon predicts what you're going to choose and then the demon either puts the money in box B or not and then you make your choice so there is that strict sequence and therefore what you're doing and understand this is the operational difference when you're playing a Newcomb's problem you're playing against the state of affairs that's already been decided this is really key that you understand what I'm saying, that the demon's already done whatever it's going to do, right? It's either put the money in box B or it hasn't. So you're playing against a state of nature, we would say, not in a Hobbesian sense, but in the sense that whatever is being decided has already been decided. And you just that you don't yet know what it is, all right? But the demon's already done what it's going to do. So you're playing against circumstances which are already established. It's just that you don't yet know what they are. Is that clear? Please tell me that's clear. This is really important to understand the applications, all right? And this is different. Good. Okay. So that's different from the prisoner's dilemma. So let me share two seemingly, perhaps seemingly strange, but actually very interesting, I think fascinating uh, examples. One of them is a theological example believe it or not. And the other one is, in fact, having to do with health science. And, and both of these are going to turn out to be Newcomb problems. And I hope you'll see the connection. So if I can manage to share the screen one more time, we'll be three for three today. Looks like it's cooperating. So you can all see this screen, right? Good. Thank you. All right. So check this out. Okay. We're looking at a kind of a Christian theology in this case called Calvinism. And it's a branch. Calvin is the is the founder of, of and there are Calvinists. I don't know. Maybe there are Calvinists in the room today. And I hope I'm not misrepresenting your theology. I believe this is to be the case with Calvinism. Calvinism uh, teaches, among other they what they believe basically is that your people are either born saved or born damned. Okay, that this has already been determined by God. And uh, if so, either you're born saved, in which case, no matter what you do, you're going to heaven. I mean, if you're born saved, then you're saved, right? And so you're going to heaven when you die and you're good. Um, or you're born damned. Uh, unfortunately, nobody wants that. But if you're born damned, then obviously you're going to hell. Nobody wants that, but that's where you're headed. So this is not a situation that you can choose from. It's a situation that's been predetermined. So now what are your choices in life? So it's clear, again, that I'm just representing the Calvinist framework here within the structure of uh, 
what turns out to be a Newcomb's problem. Why? Because Calvin says to his followers, look, you either can lead a pious life or an impious life. Those are all the choices we make. All of you, uh, all of us are making those choices, are we not? Uh, we can either be pious or impious in our conduct of life. Do you all know what pious means? What does it mean to be pious? What, what, with what do you associate piety? Right? The noun, the adjective is pious. The noun is piety. If we talk about somebody being pious, what, what do we mean? Religious, yes, but in what specific way, Erica? Yes, really, that's a synonym. But what do we mean by pious? Anything more more than religious? It does mean religious, but it means in a specific way, observantly so, devoutly so. Um, it's not just about consciousness. Yes, Erica, it's living morally in a correct way. Yes. So in other words, people who, who practice what they preach. Yes, living piously means adhering to the kinds of religious principles that the Abrahamic faiths would teach typically, although there are obviously differences among them. We're talking about humility and charity and uh, honesty and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, and obeying the commandments of Scripture. You know, conscientious, exactly, being conscientious, good. Okay, so with piety, we, we associate um, living a devout life, okay? Is that clear? Being devout. So being pious. If you're a pious person, then we would say you're also a devout person, right? You're devoted to your faith, yes? Pious means, we would say, um, I'm just typing this in. It's devoted. Devoted to your faith. That's And we have that word, devoted uh, to, to your faith. Or in other words, devout. That, that's a synonym, right? A devout life, okay? So those are your choices, Calvin says. Regardless of what you see, you don't know whether you're born, saved, or damned. You, guess what? You're not going to find out until you die. But he says you can choose whether to live a pious life or an impious life. That's the choice we make on earth. So here are the payoffs, and we set this up like a, like a Newcomb problem because it is one. Suppose you lead a pious life. Well, if you're born saved, then you're going to have piety in your life, and you're going to heaven afterwards, right? And if you're, But if you're born damned, you're going to have piety in your life, and then you're going to end up going to hell. That doesn't seem fair. But if you're born damned, it doesn't matter whether you lead a pious life or not, right? Okay? Uh, whereas if you choose impiety, says Calvin, I mean, he, he didn't say this. This is my representation of Calvinism. If you choose to lead an impious life, um, you get all the fun of being impious. Right? Because let's face it, now I'm speaking like a hedonist. If you're a hedonist, you certainly prefer impiety, don't you? I mean, hypothetically, obviously, a hedonist is someone who chases pleasure. Pleasure is, too much pleasure is definitely going to be sinful. Chasing pleasure is definitely not going to be pious. So if you're leading an impious life, let me be the devil's advocate. You're probably going to have more fun. Okay? So let's say... Let's say, for the sake of argument, it's more fun being impious, all right? Because it's more hedonistic. It's more pleasure-chasing. It's more, you know, indulging in the senses. It's more like, you know, what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and all of that good stuff. So it's more fun to lead an impious life. Now, if you lead an impious life and you happen to be born saved, you're still going to heaven, right? And on the other hand, if you lead an impious life and you're born damned, you're, you're definitely going to hell. And maybe some would say that's your, you know, just desserts. But now if you look at the payoffs, as I've written them in, isn't it clear that dominance would tell you to lead an impious life? Think about the two principles. Dominance says, hey, we don't know whether we're born saved or damned, right? We have no idea. So think about it. You don't know whether you're born saved or damned. But that's not going to change the outcome. If you're born saved, you're going to heaven. If you're born damned, you're going to hell. So if you choose to lead an impious life, that's right. That's right, Erica. But look at the payoffs. Impiety plus heaven is better than piety plus heaven. Why? Because impiety is more fun than piety, and heaven is still heaven. So 
if you choose to lead an impious life and you're born saved, you're better off than if you lead a pious life. Why? Because you're going to have more fun in this life and still go to heaven. On the other hand, if you're born damned, you're going to go to hell. Well, you might as well have some fun while you have a chance, right? Because once you go to hell, not much fun there. So again, you're better, better off being impious because you're going to at least get the fun of a short time of impiety before you burn in hell for all eternity. So either way, do you see the dominance principle telling us that we're better off being impious than pious? You get that? Dominance will tell you to be impious. I'm not telling you to be impious. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say your professor told you to lead an impious life, that you would be misrepresenting me. Please don't do that, okay? Don't misrepresent me. I'm not saying you should be impious. I'm saying that the dominance principle would prescribe impiety in this kind of a, a situation. And Ibrahim asks a very good question. Is that the same idea as Pascal's wager? It is a more uh, nuanced idea. Pascal's wager is based on something else, but it's certainly similar. Pascal was the first one to think about whether to believe or not to believe. That's a different question, right, Abraham? He's thinking about whether to believe or not to believe, and he also set it up as a kind of a game. But in any case, uh, so Nivridi, if you're going to go to hell, may as well go for something you believe in. Well, you may as well, uh, the argument for dominance in this case is if you're going to hell, you may as well have some fun first. I mean, what's preferable, going to hell and not having any fun before you get there? Or going to hell and having as much fun as possible before you get there? The argument is you may as well have some fun. Right, the second one, that's why an impious life is better. Same as heaven, if you're going to heaven, um, and you could also take advantage of being a hedonist, um, why not? Why not do it? You're going to heaven anyway if you're born saved. So all I'm saying to you is that the dominance argument is is prescribing that you're better off leading an impious life. So then you may ask, so how come there are Calvinists? So how could anybody possibly be a Calvinist? Because Calvinists are renowned for their piety. You, you know, ca ca one of the things that you will see if, if you are encountering genuine Calvinists is they're very pious people. So you may well say, well, how that? why would anybody then be a Calvinist? If dominance tells you you're better off not being a Calvinist, then why would you be a Calvinist? Ah, this is what Calvin said. And this is this is Calvin's argument. Again, my, my very brief representation. Calvin said, you'd rather be born saved than damned, wouldn't you? I'm asking you. If that were your choice, which it isn't, according to the theology, you'd I mean, most of us would rather go to heaven than hell, I presume. Am I right? Is that fair to say? Yes, okay. I mean, in a rational world, sure, we'd rather go to heaven. Okay. So Calvin now comes up with this argument saying, well, you know what? We don't know whether we're born saved or born damned, but we'd rather be saved. And he says, those who are born saved are more likely to be pious. You see how clever that is? And it's very, it very, it sounds very reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, if you're born saved, then you're more likely to be a pious person. And so if you change the ordering of that, because remember, you're born first, and the piety comes later. But if you subscribe to that, it's very easy to switch the ordering and say, you know what, if I'm a pious person, it's more likely that I was born saved. So therefore, in an effort to make it more probable that you were born saved, you might want to, in fact, be a pious person. And that's what might convince you, indeed, to lead a pious life, because you would think that it counts as evidence toward the probability that you were born saved, which you, of course, would prefer to be rather than damned. Do you get this? Isn't that clever? I'm not trying to convert anybody. P.S. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not trying myself. I'm, I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just saying this is a very clever theological argument, is it not? I think so, Eric. I think it's very clever. So then do you immediately see why this is a Newcomb problem? Because those of you who are one boxers are saying, you know what? If... <laughs> if... If the demon's a correct predictor, 
then I'm better off choosing box one, box B only, right? If the demon is a, is 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 a, if the demon is correctly predicted what I'm going to choose, then I'm definitely better off having chosen box B only. You see, it's a parallel argument. Those born saved are more likely to be pious. You're playing against the state of nature because it's already the case that you're either born saved or born damned. And in a Newcomb problem, it's already the case that the demon has either put the million dollars in box B or hasn't. By the time you make your choice whether to lead a pious life or not, it's too late to influence whether you're born saved or born damned. That's why Dominant says you might as well have some fun. But if you think that leading a pious life makes it more probable that you were born saved, then you're going to do that. And similarly, if you think choosing box B only makes it more probable that the demon put the money there, there you're going to do that. But that's really a fallacy. It's not the case that you choosing box B makes it more probable <laughs> that the demon put the money there. It is rather the case that if the demon predicted correctly, then you're better off choosing box B. But those are two different kinds of conditional statements. Now, maybe I've just lost some of you, but what I want you to see is the parallel between Newcomb's problem and Calvin's theology. You see the parallel? You're already making a choice not knowing what state of affairs is, in a sense, pre-existing, right? Being born saved and being born damned are pre-existing conditions to your choice. And what you're hoping is that leading a pious life makes it more probable that you were born saved. Any of you see the connection? You do. I think I think good if you do. So it's really a Newcomb problem. Quite uh, perhaps surprisingly that this, at least the way I have represented this theology, and I'm hoping I'm not misrepresenting Calvinism. I don't think I am. But it looks to me as though definitely this theological position is structurally identical to a Newcomb problem. And again, we don't know until we make our choice. In either case, we have to make a choice, and then we'll find out what's in box B. And similarly, in this case, choice is, of course, protracted over a lifetime. But if you choose to lead a pious life or choose to lead an impious life, at the end of that life, you will know <laughs> whether you were born saved or born dead. Okay? So it's a Newcomb problem. And Elijah, you're thinking about the categorical imperative. Interesting. Interesting. But Kant's categorical imperative is only about this world. I mean, I'm not I'm not disputing you. I'm just saying that that Kant Kant uh, didn't think that this would be very good reasoning in any case, because he remember he thinks that intentions are everything and the consequences are nothing so kant would say his categorical comparative would say lead a pious life because you could will that to be all the tenets associated with leading a pious life you could will them to be universal laws whereas all the tenets leading associated uh, so the tenets associated with leading an impious life would fail the categorical imperative test okay so uh, anyway i'm glad you're thinking about kant for whatever reason you're trying to connect some dots here. That's interesting. Now I want to show you the second example. And maybe this is more pertinent to you. Um, the second example of a arguably very different example, but nonetheless a very interesting one, I think, pertains to this scenario where we're looking at, let's say, cancer or some other, um, let's look at some of these kinds of diseases. Uh, certainly some kinds of cancers, not all, but some of them depend on whether you have a genetic predisposition, correct? Heart disease, certainly, cancer, certainly, or at least many cancers. And the issue now we know is not whether you have the genes, but whether the genes get expressed, yeah? Those of you who take biology know this, but basically what medical science is revealing to us is that it, there are two factors involved. It's not that people are condemned to having a certain disease by being born with a certain gene, let's say G, predisposition to cancer, predisposition to some uh, terrible you know, life-shortening or, or, or fatal disease, but it's whether the gene gets expressed or not that makes the difference. But let's just suppose to simplify the argument 
that were born with or without a certain gene that will lead, let's say, to a certain kind of cancer for the sake of argument, all right, or another fatal illness. And we'll suppose it's genetically uh, predetermined in some sense. So you're either born without this gene or you're born with the gene. But once again, as in Newcomb's problem, as in Calvin's theology, you don't know when you're born whether you have that gene or not. Well, now we have the technology <laughs> to sequence you and we can figure it out even probably before you're born. But let's say for the sake of argument, you know, when you're, uh, <laughs> you're gestating, your parents did not gene sequence you. So you, when you're born, still don't know. All right. Or you're not as an infant you know, sequenced. So your DNA is still a black box to you. You can't look inside. Okay. Um, so now your choice though, is to lead a healthy lifestyle or an unhealthy lifestyle, right? Those are our choices generally, correct? And we all know that um, leading a healthy lifestyle means denying certain things that we probably enjoy doing. Because let's face it, if you just want to think about diet, I mean, diet, right, has a huge influence on health. We know that better than ever. Nutrition, I don't mean dieting. I mean, the kinds of things we eat contribute very heavily, ultimately, to our healthiness or unhealthiness. That's very clear from the obesity epidemic, you know, and from other kinds of problems. What we ingest is hugely important. And we know that for some ironic reason, um, all the food that we really like usually is really bad for us. Isn't it true? If it's really good, it's really bad, right? Isn't it true? If we really enjoy eating stuff, I mean, the comfort foods that everybody loves turn out to be the unhealthiest. Are you with me? Yes, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. All the stuff we really love to, to eat is turning out to, to be very bad and might even end up killing us. So what we know is that um, um, an unhealthy lifestyle is a lot more fun than a healthy lifestyle. Let's put it that way. And that's our choice, right? But if we're born without this bad gene, then actually we can live without denial. We can smoke and drink and eat bad food and we can still live to a ripe old age. And some people do. Yeah, yeah, some people do. But then again, um, um, if you have, uh, uh, if you don't have that gene, then you can still lead a healthy lifestyle and deny yourself all those pleasures and still live to a ripe old age. But let's suppose that you lead an unhealthy lifestyle and you do have that gene, then you're going to not deny yourself all these pleasures of life. You're probably going to die young or younger than you have to. And, uh, and suppose that you, uh, uh, you're born with that gene and you lead a healthy lifestyle. That's the sucker's payoff, right? Because you're trying your best to lead a healthy lifestyle, but you're still going to get that illness. And, and, and you're going to live with denial of all these pleasures and still die young. So I hope you see that once again, it's a Newcomb problem. It's exactly the same problem because we're playing against the state of nature. and We don't know what that state of nature is until we, we die of it or, or fail to die of it, you know. And, and on the other hand, what, what, what do we do know? Dominance will tell us what? Uh, we, we're better off leading an unhealthy lifestyle, right? In either case, because if we don't have that gene, then we can have all this fun and still live to a ripe old age. We can eat whatever we want and still live to a ripe old age, right? Whereas if we do have this gene, we're going to die anyway, probably. So we may as well lead an unhealthy lifestyle. You see the parallel? So dominance will tell you, <laughs> dominance will tell us all that an unhealthy lifestyle is actually preferable to leading a healthy lifestyle. And if you think there's something wrong with that argument, you're probably right. But dominance is still dominance. It's telling us no matter what our, our genetic constitution is, which is a given thing. Again, we're playing against the state of nature. We didn't determine it. It's like the demon doing or not doing, you know, the thing with the money. It's like, Calvin saying we're born saved or born dead. We either, you know, the genetic constitution we're born with is outside our control. It's already there. So leading an unhealthy lifestyle is, is in the end um, going to be preferable no matter what our constitution is, just in the sense of hedonistic pleasure. But on the other hand, medical science will tell you what? Medical science tells you that those who live longest in general have not overindulged in unhealthy pursuits, right? I'll repeat, those who live longest, if you now start studying 
people who live to a ripe old age, let's say into their 90s typically, 80s, 90s, hundreds, a few, a few of us, but at least a lot of people in their 90s, what will they tell you that they, oh, they have a glass of red wine every day, right? Or they do, you know, they do some other little thing, but not to excess, or they walk every day, or they do, you know, but in general, they've not overindulged. I bet you, you will just, you won't find people in their 90s who like eat, you know, three Big Macs a day uh, for 50 years. If you don't believe me, watch Supersize Me. You'll be convinced. So basically what I'm saying is that um, um, it's not always true because some people don't smoke. Again, this matrix shows us that some people don't smoke cigarettes, for example, so they get lung cancer, right? Um, on the other hand, we know that there's a very strong correlation and people who do smoke cigarettes are more likely to get lung cancer. So the moral of this story is that now look at the order of the argument. Again, the medical science argument, which is the maximizing expected utilities argument, says that people who live the longest have not overindulged in healthy, unhealthy, excuse me, in unhealthy pursuits. And therefore, it would say to you, it would suggest to you that if you do not overindulge in unhealthy pursuits, you're likely to live longer. That's exactly the same reversal of the conditions as Newcomb's problem and Calvin's theology, where you say, well, if I therefore choose a healthy lifestyle, I'm likely to live longer. No, that's not necessarily true. Just like it's not necessarily true to say, well, if I choose to lead a pious lifestyle, it probably means I'm born saved. No, not necessarily. And it's also um, unsound to argue, well, if I choose box B only, it's more likely that the demon put the money there. No, that's not true either. What is true is that if the demon predicts that you'll choose box B, then the demon certainly puts the money there. And if you were born saved, it may well be more likely that you will lead a pious life. And if you're not born without this uh, uh, gene that would, perhaps shorten your life, you may still more probabilistically choose to lead a healthy lifestyle given what we now know about health. But this is why it's a Newcomb problem because you still have a dominance argument that tells you you're better off leading an unhealthy. And listen, I know a philosopher, I'm very saddened, but I know a case in point. I, I, I had a, a friend, a colleague who was a, um, a very good philosopher, but he had a congenital heart issues he he had you know though that bad gene you know a lot of heart disease is genetic unfortunately um and and it's inherited and there are a whole bunch of things that lead to either coronary artery disease or just you know things that can go wrong with the heart a lot of those do um, appear to be the expressions of, of of bad genes but he did as little as possible to prolong his life because he really enjoyed life and he said you know i'm not going to eat uh, uh, salads for the rest of my life because I don't like vegetables. So he ate all the bad foods that he enjoyed eating and he probably shortened his life by 10 or 20 years, but he made the choice. He preferred the unhealthy lifestyle. So um, he lived without denial and he died young, but he wasn't unhappy. So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Obviously he would have preferred to live without denial and continue living without denial as an old age. That didn't happen in his case. But we do have some choices in the matter. In any case, what I'm suggesting to you is, interestingly, that this is a Newcomb problem, just as the theological one was a Newcomb problem. And so Newcomb problem, surprisingly, perhaps, uh, has these applications uh, to real life. And I will end it there. That's my treatment of the Newcomb problem. Do you have any questions about this or any observations to make before we wrap up the lecture today? So everybody good to go? Okay. Thank you very much for your contributions today. Interesting as always. I'm glad you're with it and you've got your thinking caps on and you're making connections with some of the other philosophers we've looked at and other philosophers that you yourselves have read independently of this course. It's a great thing to see you make connections between what we cover and other elements of your philosophical expertise. Very nice to see that. Uh, so good job. Uh, I wish you all a very happy weekend.
And uh, so we will, yes, you too, thank you. Uh, we will convene, just to repeat one more time, we'll convene on Monday for our last plenary, believe it or not. Um, somehow it's now December. We started in August. Don't ask me where the time went, but it did. We will convene on Monday morning at 9.30 for our last plenary. And you will have an opportunity to raise any questions that come up for you or will have come up for you between now and then. And that could pertain to any of the readings in this final section of the course or to any of the readings in the course that you still have lingering questions about, or indeed any philosophical questions in a broader context that you want to ask, I'm certainly opening the floor. Um, it's a philosophy class, and in philosophy, nothing's off the table. So I encourage you to go for it, and we can have some more wide-ranging discussion on Monday if you wish, but we'll start by focusing on the material here. Okay? Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Um, you want to talk to me after class, but well, I have a meeting uh, in 10 minutes, so you can talk to me for two minutes, Trin. Okay, but I only have two minutes. Um, uh, but I think actually it would be better if you, uh, I think the more preferable thing is to email me, Trin, and make an appointment, and then we can meet without being rushed. All right? Um, I have time tomorrow. I have time uh, on the weekend also for you, if you wish. Okay? Please email me, and we'll make an appointment. Um, you won't be able to make it on Monday, uh, but you can watch. Elijah, you've been great in the class. You've contributed very, very well, and I appreciate it. Uh, but you can indeed watch the recording. I'll upload it to YouTube, and so you can profit from it, okay, on your own time. If, if you want to make an appointment to see me, I will keep extra hours for you. We'll arrange to meet in the course room. So please just send me an email, and then we'll fix something up, okay? I have a department meeting. So I really have to run. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you all um, very soon. Take care. Stay safe.